My name is James O'Dea, and for 10 years I worked for Amnesty International, most of that period as the director of its Washington office, and really spent those years confronting governments about their involvement and complicity in human rights abuse, both meeting foreign heads of state, defense ministers, foreign ministers, foreign representatives in the embassies of Washington, and of course the U.S. government at congressional testimony and uh, lobbying of the State Department, the White House, the Justice Department, the National Security Council, to explore with the U.S. government its own role in uh, promoting human rights and its obvious need to deal with some of its own complicity. And uh, when we, and the project I'm looking at is, uh, you know, the build-up to the, the military intervention in Iraq. So from your time period at Amnesty International, were you doing anything regarding Iraq and, uh, and with the United States, or what was your experiences with what was going on? When I recall some of the nightmare images of human rights abuse that are burned into my memory and even to the farther reaches of my soul, I think of images from Iraq. I think of Kurdish children whose eyes were gouged out to send a signal to their parents. Um, I think of images of Kurdish people going over the hills with their flesh dissolving from chemical weapons attacks under Saddam's regime. And the attempts that our organization made to activate the necessary levels of moral outrage and the translation of that kind of outrage into creative action by governments. I remember vividly Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights Richard Shifter in congressional testimony not being able to say that the abuses in Iraq constituted a gross and consistent pattern of human rights violations because to do so would have triggered uh, the full weight of U.S. law. And so the State Department, the Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, was reserving that final blow even in the face of the starkest of cruelty by Saddam's regime. And then to see as the story unfolded and Saddam tried to export his uh, brutal regime in the invasion of Kuwait to see how the U.S. government shifted its interpretation of the past, its interpretation of the human rights record of the government. And uh, initially that was slow. But as you know, the uh, Bush administration formed an international coalition uh, to warn Saddam that if he didn't withdraw from Kuwait, there would be consequences. And um, in the process of beating the war drum, of preparing the international audience and the coalition for U.S. action, um, the Bush administration became very interested in the human rights record of Saddam and of uh, letting people know that this man was indeed the butcher of Baghdad. That phrase emerged after the invasion of Kuwait. And then it began to focus in even more acutely uh, on what the abuses by the regime were in Kuwait. And so Amnesty International um, had a report about the abuses by Saddam uh, 
in Kuwait, which were truly horrendous. And um, the White House knew that this report was in the making, and I got regular calls asking when the report would be ready, and even um, putting as much pressure as they could to get a, a, a pre-press embargoed copy of the report, um, which I gave uh, to President Bush the weekend before it was released to the world, and uh, I wrote on the cover press embargoed report. He uh, read it at Camp David that weekend, and as he returned, there was a kind of press uproar uh, because um, uh, the president had said that uh, his wife had attempted to read Amnesty's report on Kuwait, but it was so sickening she had to put it down. And um, <clears throat> while he didn't specifically break the embargo, he let the world know that the Amnesty report um, uh, was about to be released and was uh, horrific in its uh, uh, denunciation of the abuses of, of Saddam's regime. And so um, what the White House actually started to do then was to print up copies of the Amnesty report on Kuwait. And I had a call from, I believe it was an Episcopal bishop who said, uh, did you know that uh, President Bush is handing out copies of, of this report? So you had a deeper and deeper involvement, engagement uh, uh, in the human rights story, but used very centrally as a rationale for military action. And um, this conversion to the human rights arena happened precipitously and uh, was, was not, I think, out of the deepest motivations for the human rights story per se. And, and when we flash forward to the intervention in 2003, uh, the, the U.S. going into Iraq, you know, part of after the intervention was undergoing, they were saying, we're bringing democracy and we're getting rid of a brutal dictator. And I think they, they sort of framed it as this moral dilemma where Saddam had committed all these human rights atrocities and we have to get rid of them. And uh, can you speak to sort of the human rights and the moral reasoning uh, and, and what are some of the uh, alternative options that could be used that, that have more love or compassion or, or uh, a different approach that, than, uh, than going to war? It is deeply frustrating to human rights activists to find themselves in a position where they are not listened to year in, year out, as they begin to document uh, human rights violations, as they, as they publish reports, as they published in-depth findings about deep levels of, of, of cruelty by governments, and in this case, Iraq, to uh, be essentially ignored for so long and then, and then used as a pretext for war, that somehow um, <clears throat> this level of um, of conversion to human rights only occurs when the government is willing itself to use the last resort. And so the, the first basic, you know, moral position here is, is the attention that is required when human rights situations are building. This was clearly the case in the former Yugoslavia of a repeated buildup of human rights informa information and finally military action, as it was in Iraq. And um, uh, if there is truly a commitment to human rights, it needs to be uh, when uh, something can really be done about it. 
and uh, I think it's it's quite distressing <laughs> for human rights activists to see that their work is ignored when thousands of lives can be saved, uh, and then in this case. Uh, Many years later, after the peak of the atrocities have have really been over, uh, I mean, the most egregious violations uh, were not happening in Iraq when the U.S. invaded. They had happened in the previous decade and were essentially not acted upon. And. Uh when you look at you know coming to work every day, being morally outraged, eventually you move to work, the type of work that you're doing now. Can you speak to you know what you're doing now and 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 how you see uh, how effective it was to be morally outraged and, and be ignored? Is what I sort of hear what you're saying. I think that um, one of the things that 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 so powerfully activated me in Amnesty International was those examples all around the planet, really, of people of conscience who were willing to stand up to governments, who were really willing to face the most powerfully oppressive regimes in the world with their own bodies, with their own spirit, with their own sacred, you know, purpose in raising aloft the, the, the human enterprise and that uh, to align oneself with those forces is an incredible privilege and to exploit, uh, you know, the human rights story for other purposes I think is, is deeply demeaning of the true enterprise that is in the human rights story of the, of the people of conscious, conscience and courage in the world who are really trying to protect fundamental freedoms, the freedom of thought, the freedom of speech, the freedom of creative action. And so, you know, when I think about Iraq, for example, and I think of all of those people in Iraq who, who desperately needed support, at the right time, who needed the world on their side, who were largely ignored, where action really wasn't taken. Um, and then to have, you know, in another context, action devised that uh, is said to be on their half, I think requires really deep scrutiny at a moral level. And, um, you know, to enact a war requires the highest level of moral scrutiny, particularly a war that is a preemptive war in the name of all of those who have suffered and have been slaughtered. It requires deep moral scrutiny for us to really see what were the designs and purposes and the intentions of, of a war like this. For it to be truly a just war w would require, I think, much more than we ever saw delivered in, in terms of moral argument or persuasion in this case. And, and talk a, bit, a little bit about the dualism between outer action and inner peace. And do you see sort of the outward actions that you're doing before as more outer and the stuff that you're doing now is more inner? And, and talk a little about, you know, ion, the Institute of Noetic Sciences and what you're doing now. Um, could we just stop for a second? Sure. Um, um, so in speaking of, of sort of the spiritual aspects of of these types of issues and what we see in the media, you know, what what types of things or messages would you have liked to have seen incorporated in, in the debate leading up to the war in Iraq? It's really important for us to understand the depth 
world of the human rights story. So, you know, at, at one level we have people who are murdered, tortured, executed, and we have a search for justice to bring those people responsible uh, to justice for their crimes. But what we understand is that the, it's not quite that easy, that families are wounded, that the suffering is taken on into a, an intergenerational journey, and that the wounds of the psyche and of the soul are profound. The grandmothers who were raped in Bosnia weren't raped out of licentiousness by the soldiers. They were raped because they were images of something that was sacred to the community. If you rape the grandmother, you're, 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 you're stabbing the deep psyche of the community in an intergenerational wound. So oppression is always about making dirty, making trash out of the dignity of another. It's trying to rob the, the, the spiritual depth, the soul, the dignity, the honor, the beauty of whatever it is you are trying to erase, disappear. And so in the deep unfolding of the human rights story, we have to be able to look at where those wounds go, where they go into hiding, where they lurk, and where responsibility lies. And you begin to see, as you look historically, it's almost like arctic wastes of, of incredible levels of responsibility for abuse that are left un, unaddressed, untouched. I think of the U.S. government and I think of the U.S. as a country and its, its beautiful aspirations and its, its search for the soul of democracy. And yet there are great areas of consequence that have to be confronted in the soul and psyche of America with regard to being the world's largest exporter of all kinds of weapons of destruction. That, that once you get into the, the deep story, you have to look at consequences. You have to look at the whole behavior. You have to look at the dark underbelly, the hidden places, to see the full story. And so, just as the, you know, the person of conscience brings their own light, there is, in the depth of, of, of the human rights story, the word truth is there. What is the truth? And again, that's a very layered experience of there are superficial truths and um, the media know how to report those. The deeper truths, the deeper you go, they require more courage to explore. They require looking into that dark underworld and facing stuff that is difficult to face. But we know even in a simple psychological equation that unless one does that as an individual, one is going to have some psychological problems. And so the psyche of America is one that um, has some very lofty purposes and has a dark underworld that it has not made itself accountable for. And the media, uh, in large parts, reflects less and less an ability to explore that dark underworld. And it's not just about conspiracies and stuff like that. It's about facing the consequences of certain avenues of action, of looking at relationship. It, and, you know, as one explores the field of consciousness, for example, you know, one can no longer uh, 
live with any sort of ease in a polarized, dualistic framework that says, good is here, evil is over there, they are not related, they are inseparable. When the people of Bali... Were, I'm just, okay. I'm, 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 in the film, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on uh, just a rock, so okay. I don't, don't want to go too far off okay. uh, these other stories that are important but not going to be integrated. So I guess another... You know, so 9-11 is not... Well, 9-11, I, I mean, to follow up, I guess, when you look at the, the trauma of 9-11 and what it did to the psyche of America during this time period, you had a lot of fear still. So right. So talk a little bit about... Well, that's where the Bali reference was. But oh, okay. Maybe... Um, but yeah, so... so in so, Bali, what they when they were hit by the terrorists, shall I... Yeah, just, no, just start from... You can edit when Bali was hit by the terrorists, the dominant Balinese response was, what is our relationship to this? Think for a moment what might have happened if the U.S. government had for a moment asked itself, what is our relationship to this attack upon us? What might we have done in the world to have drawn so much anger towards us. Not that, that there is a simple, let's beat up on ourselves equation here, but at least that basic question, what is our relationship to this? And how can we change our relationship to it is really fundamental. And the, the level of denial the depth of denial in the U.S. government's response to create a scenario in which the only way out of this wound, of this terrible wound, was to deny the truth system around the wound and to look for some alternative attention-grabbing phenomenon. And so the whole response of the country was drawn into this level of theater, a theater of denial, a theater where the substance of truth was really lost at every level. The substance of truth was lost in the basic arguments about this war. Th those were prov proven to be great falsehoods. And then when you get to the level of moral truth, it isn't there anywhere. So the more you dig into where the substance of truth was, it was gone. And <clears throat> it, 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 it serves, I think, to really analyze how the population f were fed this, where, where is the, the psychology of it, and where is the politique, and, and fundamentally, why the media had lost its own bearings in relationship to core truths. It's as if the media had started to consign itself to a rather trivial level of surface reporting, and where the great questions uh, that the media should be pursuing were abandoned. That does not bode well for the future because if, if the deeper questions of truth are not explored by the media, where are they explored? Okay. All right. And uh, when you look at sort of um, when politicians are creating this sort of false dichotomy in a way of good, evil, or you know, this is our right way, the other way is the wrong way, and, and losing a lot of the ambiguity. Can you speak to, you know, what effect does that have on, on consciousness and, and ingraining us into these very stiff paradigms? So we would say that, you know, Western civilization has come into being around a fundamental dichotomy or split 
between spirit and matter. And, you know, we talk about this in terms of the Newtonian approach and so on. But that there is a fundamental difference between material stuff and the nature of spirit. That split works really well also for a simple moral equation of good and evil, that there is a fundamental split, that things, the nature of reality can be just like that. You have good over here and evil over here. You've got spirit here, you've got matter there. But everything in scientific research and study and the, the study of consciousness itself suggests that that is really a false dichotomy. That in fact matter itself is pervasively interfused with subtle energy. We know from quantum reality that uh, the whole structure of the material world is of the subtlest, most refined forms of energy itself. And so we begin to look into a mapping of reality that is much different than the old right-wrong, God above, matter below kind of universe into a universe of interconnectivity. And, and, and so interfused and interrelated that it's inseparable. And as we study this arena, we see so much of the nature of the interconnection of our own thoughts and intentions and perceptions about the world. Now, in that kind of mapping, uh, what you can see clearly is that good versus evil is a simple polarity, but that the, the framework of even the quantum world itself is non-polarized, is a both-and structure, not an either-or structure. And that uh, we have to be able to work these levels of subtlety and complexity if we are to, um, I think, survive a story that is at best fundamentalist. And the fundamentalist approach is one of a meaning system that is self-enclosed in its own argument. And I, I think we need to examine systems that are self-enclosed in, in this way, whether they exist in religions or in politics, or even to some extent in the realms of the public media, because they, they contain nice dichotomies that are easily marketable, um, but that do not reflect reality. And, and so when you uh, speak to um, a little bit about the evolution, uh, cultural evolution in the sense of realizing that there are these new categories and trying to integrate new categories and, and how that, that flows into um, uh, personal evolution and then on a macro level sort of cultural evolution. One of the elements that I think is very hopeful in our evolution is that um, while on the surface and from a simple analysis, uh, we have unidimensional or at least uh, easily um, named identities uh, the reality is much more complex and more interesting. We are emerging into a period when human beings are carrying multiple identities. And it's this multiplicity of identities that is beginning to have, I think, a very hopeful um, message for the future and the evolution of the species. Because if you only have one identity, and it is your religion, and, and your gender, uh, 
and um, the place where you come from, so your nationality, your gender, and your religion. And those, those identities are fixed, and you stand by them, and they don't change, then um, you're locked into something that's manageable in terms of simple dichotomies, us versus them, right versus wrong, they're either a part of us or they're not, they're either for us or against us. Uh, it's a very simple painting of the identity equation. And yet, uh, what is happening is that, you know, as, as we evolve, people are merging their identities. There are modern identities that have taken on very deep indigenous aspects to them. There are indigenous people, you know, from, from many parts of the world who are out there on the internet talking about the planet Earth from the same vision of an indigenous perspective, but incorporating many of the tools of, of the modern world and trying to grapple with the things that the modern world grapples with. And um, I think this fluidity uh, is, is growing in many, many ways. If we, each of us looks at our lives and looks at the complex dimensions of our cultural view, how much do we, when we wake up in the morning, do we really think of ourselves as planetary citizens? Some of us wake up in the morning, more and more of us wake up in the morning and think about the skies around the earth. We trouble ourselves to think about the skies around the earth because that is part of our identity now, to think that there are holes you know, in the ozone layer and that we as a little citizen in some remote location have to now trouble ourselves. And in fact, it's not only troubling ourselves, it's actually entering into an identification with the planet, an identification with the emerging cultures of the planet and, and their aspirations for sustainability. So I think that, that uh, the new mapping of identity and the porous nature of the flow between meaning systems is is very hopeful because it will pull us out of small, confined, parochial views of reality. Governments that can talk about um, morality but not really live morality in a way th that common people understand. And, and when we look at even within the political system in America, we have this dichotomy between Republicans and Democrats. And can you speak to sort of the polarization that's even happening between those um, two parties and, and sort of what you see as a way to reduce that polarization through um, understanding a conflict resolution or, or you know, look at the state of, of the United States now and see how divided it is and in, in the importance of trying to bring understanding. Arthur Kersler uh, coined this term holon, and a holon is something that is a whole thing in itself, but part of a greater whole. And that uh, it's very helpful for us to begin to see how we are whole in ourselves and how we are part of greater wholes. So, um, you know, the, whatever shades of political opinion exist, for example, in the United States, um, Democrat, Republican, uh, progressive, conservative, those things may be whole as views in themselves, but what is the larger whole that they are a part of? And um, when one goes to that dimensional level of seeing, well, what is it that uh, in fact is the higher state of unity uh, 
between these things that at a lower dimensional level are, are, are different. Um, that's a really interesting question because again one sees that at, the, at, at a higher level of unity there is much more flow happening than is perceived in this rather comic stereotype of the so-called conservative and the so-called progressive. There is an ocean's flow that is moving between them and uh, the, the danger uh, would be obviously if there was a really rigid division uh, between these views, but I can't see that that is possible. I, I know that the media play a tremendous role in affecting people's perceptions. In fact, we even talk these days about media trance, about levels of pulling in people's attention and awareness um, in, in ways that are heavily conditioning, much more deeply conditioning than, um, you know, picking up a newspaper in the morning uh, alone. But when you combine the full effect of all forms of media, it can be deeply conditioning. And if the thrust of the media is an oversimplified, uh, consumable version of the conservative versus the progressive, um, it, does, it does exacerbate the polarity, but it is fundamentally a superficial one, and one that in evolutionary terms, we are not far from a much greater confluence of meaning that pulls people together around in this concept of a holon, a much higher level of relationship around planetary issues, sustainabilities, and real value. Because what I think is in the human quest is a deeply moral purpose. That human beings, of course, go through all shades of political development in, in their evolution. But when you look at the whole evolutionary wave, what you see is, is maybe not what manipulators of attention or political manipulation sees as easy, easily, is a basic moral quest in human beings to find greater meaning, greater purpose, a greater sense of unity, and that we are permeable membranes, that whether we like it or not, the world is flowing into our psyche and out of it. It is washing us with its own struggles for meaning, and that eventually that level of truth, the truth of experience, the truth of what is really happening on the planet washes through us and creates a new evolutionary moment where there is a greater sense of integration and purpose. And so when we, when we think about uh, people's own moral belief system and attitudes and beliefs, that sort of, you know, sort of serves as a filter. Can you kind of uh, speak about um, these filters that people have in perceiving reality and, and how easy it is to get really stuck in your own uh, paradigm of what you see is right, either, either uh, reality-based or political-based? Perception is very causal. What you perceive is happening is what is going to precipitate your response. And so those who understand how to affect uh, 
your perceptions, how to create filters so that you are tempted to perceive things in certain ways, know that they are going to have a causal result and that um, we then have to ask ourselves, what is the practice around dealing with my own perception? Okay, how, how deeply entrenched in some matrix of manipulation am I? And how would I ever find my way out of it? Um, it's, a, it's a very potent question for contemporary civilized beings to be able to say, how can I use my own tool of consciousness to get out of the matrix, particularly if it's a destructive matrix, into a more whole creative matrix of human uh, creativity and, and uh, the maximal expression of, of my sense of being. And so it is to go to that place of perception. What am I seeing? And how does it relate to who I am? And how, what are the questions that I ask? So that really, you know, constantly one has a view of the world. We call it a world view. This is how I make sense out of the world. Unless you are revising that world view constantly, you are in trouble. So there's a clue. If the world view is fixed, if it's like the movie is stuck and you are constantly being fed the same vision of reality, there's a warning sign. Something's up. You're, you're too deeply caught in what the, the spiritual teachers would say, the depth of the illusion. So to move out of the depth of the illusion so that your own perception, your field of perception widens and you begin to see, okay, I, I can generalize a little bit more. I can say this is true and that is true. The more I can generalize, the more my field of perception is going to widen. The more I will be revising my worldview. We know in consciousness studies that the most central activator of meaning is belief. What do you believe? Do you believe that, you know, the table is made of wood? <laughs> or do you believe, you know, that below the wood is a sea, an ocean of energy? What you believe creates the, the context of your reality. And if your belief is fixed, then how can you be free? How can you, as a, as, a, as a player in the whole system, work it out and contribute your part to creating new value and, and meaning? You have to be revising your belief, extending your belief. There's a 13th century Sufi philosopher, Muhyiddin Ibn al-Arabi, you know, and he said you can never challenge the God of another person's belief. That's missionary enterprise, right? I can't come along and say to you, you know what? You, you out there, you, you're believing the wrong thing. That's to interfere with you and how you make meaning. But what I can say is, well, you believe that, and you over there, you believe that. Oh, that's interesting. I can, I can generalize. So where you specify and say, God is only this, I can generalize because I can say, well, and that person believes that God is only that. So I'm now in a position to expand the territory of meaning. And it's up to each individual to be that alive, to expand their own capacity to create meaning. We do not deliver that to any media outlet, any government, any religion in the world. Because that is the center. You know, Giordano Bruno talked about the omnicentric universe. The omnicentric universe. The, 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 the center is everywhere. That's the most foolproof system 
for matrixes of medium manipulation and trance that exists in the structure of the universe. Because maybe evolution realized at some point that there would be dangers for the human imagination and for the human soul and freedom. And so it had to construct a, a modality that would inherently give the human being the absolute right to its own freedom. And it did so in that way by having within it the capacity to extend and create its own meaning and value system and to share, of course, that with others. I think, uh, what's it? hold on, I, I, let me just finish follow up, Jen. Uh, when, uh, when you look at um, people's, uh, what, is it the camera? Or? I was telling you about the time and okay. that you want to answer the same question in three minutes. Okay, time. okay. Uh, when you have, um, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Hold on a second. Um, mm-hmm. um, when you look at, uh, I, I would know people who would say, well, I'm comfortable in my belief system. I'm, I, I like where I live and I don't want to change who I'm voting for or, or what, I'm, what, what my belief and, and why, what's the worst case scenario for for being completely comfortable and locked in your own belief system. I believe there is grave danger in battening down the hatches and stopping the evolutionary clock and fixing your belief in space and time and and not opening it up to the possibility of other encounters with belief. In some ways, that is my definition of fundamentalism. And it may, your belief may look beautifully progressive, but if you are only going to stay there, it's a meaning system that does not know how to wake up in the morning and extend itself towards other meanings. If it has made some determination that those over there, whether you call them progressives or fundamentalists or whatever name or label you put on them, are not a place I want to go because I am so happy putting my feet up and soaking into my own belief system. It's quite enough for me. There is great danger there. There is not only the danger that you will be swept away (laughs) by the meaning systems that are gathering together, that are communicating with each other, that are in dialogue with each other, that are learning from each other, that are growing together, where you'll be left alone in your own meaning system, but you won't have the fun. You won't have the experience of the fecundity of meaning, where you grow in meaning and to grow in meaning, to feel a deepening sense of how life can come together uh, is an expansion of being itself. I think one reflects a contraction of being and the other because, because being essentially wants to reach out, to extend, to know the other. That the fundamental structure of the universe is very relational. We are in relationship to each other whether we like it or not. And certainly, as we look deep into the substrate of matter and its relationship to consciousness, we see that we are profoundly interconnected. Scientists refer to it as entanglement. We are entangled. And and so when you look at this sort of this interconnectivity, you know, what is your your vision for where we're at? as a world and in the state of things and where we need to go to achieve a more, you know, sustainable or more, more world peace, uh, as well. You know, what, what are things that the country and individuals can do within the United States to get to that point? Toynbee had a theory of the cycles of history and there are other theories about generational cycles. And we can see clearly in the path of evolution that there are great cycles of conflict, 
and out of that period of conflict arises a whole new synthesis of meaning and the beginning of a new renaissance of thought and human creativity. And that lasts for a period and that begins to decline and it declines so much it unravels and in the unraveling you begin a period of conflict again. And so uh, what I think we see on an evolutionary scale is that those cycles is, don't simply repeat themselves, but they broaden in scope because each cycle brings a greater sense of inclusion of meaning and inclusion of our understanding and purpose. So now we're at a epical cycle in which the emergence of a planetary consciousness is trying to, is not trying, is coming forth. There are people around the planet who really think in terms of planetary sustainability, planetary life, ways in which the multiplicity of cultures can learn from each other, ways in which the great wisdom of the spiritual traditions can share with each other. This isn't a theory, this is happening for a number of people. And so that pushing up, evolutionary pushing up into that cycle is uh, creating a, a clarion call <laughs> to those entrenched meaning systems that say, no, I don't want to go up there. I, I, I'm quite comfortable down at this other level. I'm making a big profit <laughs> out of this. Uh, and that, that will no doubt create conflict. Our challenge is not that conflict is bad, and not at all. I think it's part of the evolutionary thrust. So, Conflict is a simply a part of, of uh, reality itself. How can we engage in conflict in ways that don't create so much pain, destruction, and suffering? How can each of us look at the ideas that we are thrusting out into the world in terms of what their consequences will be for the lives of other people? We must dialogue or we will destroy each other. So the dialogic emphasis, I, I think, is central because in, in that approach, we have a reaching out for higher levels of integration of meaning. And, and truly, the adventure is limitless in that sense. And for those who can imagine it, who see it. You know, Einstein, this brilliant thinker, said, it is imagination which encircles planet Earth. Mere knowledge is limited. It's our ability to imagine that next state of the human enterprise and see its beauty in our minds that I think is part of an extraordinary adventure. Okay, and, and when you look at, um, on an individual basis, um, here at IONS you speak of a shift, an upcoming paradigm shift, and a different way of seeing sort of the, the Western way of thinking to a more Eastern way of thinking, or can you describe this shift, and, and what does it mean, and, and how do you, what sort of things do you see that are indicating this? The evolutionary shifts in consciousness um, as with the entire struggle for human rights, is all about greater inclusion. So in, this, in the great story of human rights, we can now talk about the universal declaration of human rights. We can start talking about the rights of disabled people and the rights of gay people and the rights of people who were never included before. And in a similar way, you know, as our consciousness evolves, it becomes more inclusive. It can gather more and more with it and still feel whole and still feel centered. And so I think that that sense of inclusion and our ability to include others is a central theme. And, and so when you if you were to tell that to someone who was very afraid of a terrorism and didn't see them as just wanting to kill them, you know, how can you include them as being 
part of the same whole if terrorists want to uh, you know, come and, and attack us? How do you deal with that? When we ended the Second World War, we had the Nuremberg Trials, and we thought that this was a great benchmark in history to end the greatest conflict that humanity has ever known with legal trials and a legal solution rather than more war and more oppression for those who created the war. And since Nuremberg, we've come a tremendous journey and very fast. South Africa ended its years of terrible conflict with a truth, reconciliation, and forgiveness approach that said we can go even beyond the legal into the emotional and the spiritual. We can tell the truth to each other, and the very hearing of that truth will help us forgive the other, because if I can hear the other person's story, if I can really hear what it was like, I might be able to understand them. And so I have been in dialogue with former Nazis and Holocaust survivors where they deeply forgive each other, where they recognize that they were caught in stories, they were caught in the velocity of meaning systems that simply took hold of whole groups of people and ripped through society like a wind. And to isolate out individuals and their culpability is important at one level, not to be denied, but there's a greater story. And so, you know, we, wherever we are and however f afraid we are of the enemy at our doors and the one that we are told is the truly evil one and the darkest of all forces, if we can imagine what humanness lies there, what, what is reaching on the other side, it won't immediately solve all of our problems. We may have to take very strict measures to protect ourselves, but we begin to open up our own awareness to the story of the other. And the story of the other is often bitterly mundane. You know, Saddam Hussein did not have a happy childhood. And of course, that's not to explain away his level of evil, but it is to see him as a human being who got caught and who contributed to many terrible things. So the beginning of the story is always relationship. What is my relationship to this thing that comes towards me? And if we think we have no relationship, and that we can simply close our doors and our windows and crawl under the blankets, we will find that what we are most afraid of is right inside us, there, under the blankets. And we have to deal with it still. We still have to relate to it. Okay, let me do some uh, room tone here. So just sit tight for like 10 seconds. Okay, and just finally, um, how, how can people deal with their fear? What are some practical t tools that you might have to, so people can deal with whatever fear they have um, with current events and world affairs? I believe we are drawn more by the possibilities than by describing the calamitous and there are so many ways that we can learn about the courage and conviction and heroism of human beings. In my years at Amnesty International, you know, I learned so much about people like Irina Ratushinskaya, 
was sent, you know, into prison for, for seven years hard labor for writing her poetry about love. And in prison, she would receive a bar of soap and uh, occasionally to wash herself. And the poet must see her words in writing. So with her fingernail, she would write her poetry on this bar of soap. And then under the eyes of her, her oppressors, she, the poet washed herself with her poetry. And 250...